Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In today's lecture, we are going to talk about sound and we'll look at some things like how sound propagates through the atmosphere and how fast it is able to propagate, propagate how we can determine that speed. And we also want to look at measuring how loud sound is using the concept of decibels, which is how we measure sound. So let's go ahead and get started today. And what we have, first of all, let's look at sound a little bit and review that. We looked at this in a previous lecture, but sound is a disturbance of matter from the source outward. So that is a wave. Remember that a wave was something that was a disturbance that propagates outward from where it formed. So we call that sound is an example of a wave. It is a disturbance of matter. That means that it has to propagate through some kind of material. Sound waves cannot propagate through a vacuum. So you cannot hear sound coming from space because it has to propagate through a vacuum. And unlike light waves, which we'll look at in a future chapter, the, uh, the sound waves cannot propagate through that. So sound waves cannot propagate through a vacuum. Now in terms of hearing, what is hearing is our perception of the sound waves. So that's what we hear when those sound waves reach our eardrum, causing it to vibrate. Then we will hear that and our brain converts that into the sounds. Note that all frequencies of sound cannot necessarily be heard. There are sounds that are much too high or too low for humans to detect. However, you have things like a dog whistle which we don't hear. However, it produces vibrations that a dog's ears are sensitive to. So different animals have different sensitivities to different frequencies of sound. We can also look another way to produce sound is through vibrating strings. That is a way to produce sound waves. And what they do is they can create compressions and rarefactions. So areas where there is a little bit more atmosphere, the atmosphere is a little bit denser and areas where it is a little bit uh, less dense. So a compression would be there is a higher density here and a rarefaction would be that there's a lower density here on the dotted line. So as it moves out, those compressions and rarefactions will propagate outward and those are what then strike our eardrum and that we then note as waves. So as the wave continues to vibrate, just one of these will get very little. But as it continues to vibrate, it will send out the pattern of, con of adjacent compressions here and rarefactions here. And we'll see them in a pattern that will then propagate outward until they reach our ears that where we can then detect them. Now we want to look at the speed of a wave. How do we detect? How do we determine the speed of a wave? Well, we also looked at this previously, but it is a wave. We looked at how to calculate the frequency uh, or sorry, the speed of a wave. And that was using the equation shown here that V of the wave, the velocity of the wave is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So sound is an example of a wave. So it has a certain speed it travels at. It has a frequency and it has a wavelength. Now the speed of sound depends on what it is traveling through. As I said, it cannot travel through a vacuum. So in that case, then the velocity of the wave would be zero. It cannot travel at all. It does not propagate through a vacuum. It is stopped completely. It will travel slowly through gases and it will travel faster through solids. So it's a way you can hear things. Sometimes you watch an old Western movie. If you see someone put their ear to the ground to hear the distant train or the distant thump of horses hooves, that's because they will travel faster through the ground than they will through the atmosphere. And you would note them before listening to the ground. You could hear them before you could possibly hear them through the atmosphere. So the more solid the material is, the faster the waves will travel. So they can travel much faster through a solid object than they can through the atmosphere or things like gases. Now, as we continue here, let's go ahead and look at how we get the exact uh, distances or exact velocities. So the equation for the speed of sound is given here, and it depends on the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere. 
Now, if we're looking at just sea level, so we're ignoring pressure dependence, then it depends just on the temperature here. So if you know the temperature of the atmosphere, you can then calculate the velocity of that sound wave. It is 331 meters per second multiplied by the square root of that temperature divided by 273 Kelvin. So at 273 Kelvin, which as you may recognize that is the same as zero degrees Celsius, then this would be one, the square root of one is one and that leaves you with 331 meters per second for the velocity of sound. If the air is a little bit warmer at 20 degrees Celsius, that would be 293 Kelvin, which we would put in here, divide that by 273, take the square root, multiply that by 331 and find that it would be 343 meters per second. So in warmer air sound will travel faster. Uh, it will also uh, so it'll travel much travel faster. The higher the temperature, the faster the sound will travel. The colder the temperature, the slower the sound will travel. And we can think of that as the particles in the atmosphere are moving quicker at those higher speeds. So they are able to vibrate more and respond and pass through the sound waves as they travel through. We also find that the speed of sound does not depend on the frequency. And in a way for musicians, that's a very good thing. What would that mean for music in a large stadium? Well, if higher frequencies traveled faster, then you'd, that would be a not, not a good thing because higher frequencies would get to your ears faster. So what may sound all the same to an orchestra up on the stage that all the frequencies are reaching them at essentially the same time. Someone way out at the edge of the stadium would have the higher frequencies reaching them first and then the lower frequencies reaching them later. And it certainly would not sound like the composition that it is supposed to. So let's go ahead and look at an example of using this to calculate the uh, sound, sound waves. What we're going to do is First, find the wavelengths of sounds at the extremes of the audible range in 30 degrees Celsius air. So what we want to find is the velocity first. We're going to look for the velocity and that will allow us to calculate the wavelengths. We're given the frequencies 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz are the two extremes. Once we know the velocity, we can then calculate what this is. But first we need to calculate velocity. So how do we do that? Well, we have our equation which says the velocity of the wave is 331 meters per second times the temperature in Kelvin, the square root of the temperature in Kelvin divided by 273 Kelvin. So next step is we have to convert and I've kind of jumped through that here, but you have to convert the 30 degrees Celsius convert it to Kelvin. So it's 273 plus 30 which equals 303 Kelvin which is what we want to put in here 303 divided by 273 and we take the square root of that multiply it by 331 and we get 348.7 meters per second so now we have the velocity so we can go ahead and calculate the wavelengths. Remember how those are related. The velocity is equal to the frequency multiplied by the wavelength. And if we rearrange that, we find that the wavelength is equal to the velocity divided by the frequency. Well, remember, the velocity is the same. It doesn't depend on the frequency. So we have the velocity of this wave at 348.7. And we know the two frequencies, 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. So now we can go ahead and calculate those two wavelengths. And what we get, the maximum wavelength we would get for the lowest frequency would be 348.7 meters per second divided by 20 hertz gives us 17 meters. So that would be the long end of human hearing it would be a wave sound wave 17 meters long. How about the low end? Well, the low end, we again, we take the same 348.7. We divide it now by 20,000 and we get 1.7 centimeters. So our range of what we can hear is waves that are about a little less than two centimeters, a little less than an inch in wavelength 
and up to those that are 17 meters in wavelength. So that's about the range of typical human hearing. Now the other thing we wanted to look at here is the idea of intensity of sound. How do we measure the sound intensity? First of all, what is the intensity? Well, it depends on how energetically the source is vibrating. So we have the example of the bird here. The bird uh, uh, singing quietly gets a very low amplitude wave coming out, a low amplitude sine wave. The bird here with his mouth open wide, making a very loud noise, is then going to have a very high amplitude. Now notice, Joe's the frequency is still the same. It is the amplitude that is telling us about the intensity. So this is what tells us about the intensity, how intense the wave is. Here it's a very small amount. In the first bird situation, in the second one, it's a very large amount. So that's how we can measure it. It is all the intensity it is the amplitude that tells us the intensity of the wave. And we measure these in units of decibels. Now decibels are unusual compared to other units that we typically use. Uh, they are an example of a logarithmic unit. We also use these for things like earthquakes. Earthquake scale, the Richter scale, is also a logarithmic scale. And it allows us to look at very large ranges with not changing the numbers too much, with being able to compress a very wide range of intensities into much smaller numbers. And that sound, that decibel, is here given here by the Greek letter beta. And it is equal to 10 multiplied by the base 10 logarithm. That's the common logarithm on a calculator. It'll generally just say LOG or LOG with the subscript 10 of the ratio of the intensity to the minimum intensity, sort of the, almost the minimal detectable intensity of hearing. And that is 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. So if we were looking at an intensity of 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter, we would get a decibel rating of 10 times the base 10 log of 10 to the minus 12th divided by 10 to the minus 12th. And if you remember, anything divided by itself is 1. So that would be 10 log of 1. And the logarithm of 1, the base 10 logarithm of 1, is going to be 0. So that would give us a decibel equivalent of 0. So that is the minimal defining of what we're able to hear. So we can look at a table of this to get an idea of these ranges. So here is the threshold that I talked about last time. The decibel rating is 0. That is the intensity of 10 to the minus 12 watts per square meter. That is our threshold of hearing. Anything less than that, we would be unable to hear. Now, if you look at, we go down, there's very quiet things here, rustle of leaves, a whisper at a meter away, uh, through an average home, normal conversation, and you're up to things in the 60 decibel range. Now, when you start to get to 90 decibels or more, this is where it starts to get very damaging. So, Inside a large truck, you can get damage from prolonged exposure here. Uh, factory, this, this you need about eight hours per day of exposure to cause damage. So this one isn't going to cause you extended damage unless you're doing it all the time. This one you need to average about eight hours per day. But when you get up even larger, here you only need 30 minutes per day. And once you hit 120, it's starting to get painful. This is where your ear will start to you'll start to get pain from that if you're really close to a jet airplane. So how do people work close to a jet airplane? Well, we mentioned in a previous lecture, noise canceling headphones can cancel that by putting in the opposite of that very strong sound and canceling those two. When you get up this large, you can cause damage within just seconds. And at 160, eardrums are bursting because that is just such a large, intense wave. So this just kind of gives you some idea of that range. But as I said, as a logarithmic scale, it goes from 0 to 160. If we look at it as a linear scale, it goes from 10 to the minus 12th. Remember, a zero, you got 11 zeros and a 1 there to 10,000. 
watts per square meter. So it compresses the range and gives us numbers that are much easier to be able to comprehend. Now let's go ahead and look at one example with this to calculate this. So what do we have? We have a sound wave traveling through the atmosphere that has an intensity of 5.04 times 10 to the negative fourth watts per square meter. And we want to convert this into decibels. Well, we have our equation that we had that we gave, which is that the uh, the uh, intensity in decibels is equal times to 10 times the base 10 log of the intensities, the ratio of the intensity that you have we've given here this intensity to 10 to the minus 12th as the minimal intensity of hearing. So we know those we can then put those into the equation and calculate and when you take that logarithm, you will get that the it would be an 87 decibels. So that would be a relatively loud noise. You can go back to look at the previous section to kind of see where that fits in. And let's go ahead and do that here. If we go back a little bit, we can see that an 87 decibel is not in the damaging range, but is getting in there. That's a classroom lecture to inside a heavy truck. We're somewhere in this range of of noise intensity with that with that with that intensity that we are, we had. So you can look at that and you could way that you can calculate what the intensity in decibels is as long as we know the intensity in watts per square meter. You can also work it the other way around and you can resolve this. It's a little bit more complex uh, than typically because you have to get rid of the logarithm and we can look at that at another time. So let's go ahead and finish up here with our summary. And what we looked at today was that sound waves are a disturbance uh, of matter. So a disturbance of matter, some kind of material that propagates outward. And the sound waves are specifically ones that are a frequency that to which our ears are sensitive. So if our ears are not sensitive, we generally don't classify that in as sound. The speed of sound depends on the medium through which it travels and the temperature. Remember, it does not depend on the frequency of the wave. And we can measure the intensity of sound using the decibel scale, which is an example of a logarithmic scale. So that concludes this lecture on sound. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day, everyone, and I will see you in class.